listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that helps you make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids through books. Hello, hello, everybody. It's episode 133 of the Read Aloud Revival. I'm Sarah McKenzie. I hope you're having a wonderful summer. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, that is, <laughs> and a cozy winter if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Today, we've got a new book list for you, and it's a delightful conversation that I think is going to feel very summery. So I'm happy that you're here for it. First, if you want the book list we talk about on today's show, and of course you do, right? <laughs> you want to get it from the show notes, and those are at readaloudrevival.com slash 133. We're going to name a whole bunch of books and talk about Lots of books you're going to want to get your hands on. So you want to make sure you visit those show notes to grab them. Of course, we have the clickable list as always, as well as a free printable download that you can grab if you want to get the books from your library or just keep it with you on the go. So that's readaloudrevival.com slash 133. Now, I want to take a minute to make sure you are getting emails from Read Aloud Revival. Every so often, we hear from those who are just listening to the podcast and haven't signed up for our emails. And of course, we love that you're here listening. <laughs> But we don't want you to miss out on all the wonderful free resources we put together for you on a regular basis. We assemble book lists and resources for you that don't always make it onto the show here. So you need to be getting our emails to get those. So for example, in a couple of weeks, we will have a brand new book list we've been working on all summer of the wonderful picture books set in the Middle Ages. And that book list is not going to be on a podcast episode. It's just a book list. So if you're not on the email list, you might miss it. Over 100,000 families get our weekly emails. I think you'll find out why as soon as you start getting our resources delivered to your own inbox each Tuesday morning. It's free, of course. So go to rarbooklist.com to get on that email list. And then you'll know that you're not missing a thing that we are offering here at Read Aloud Revival, especially those wonderful free book lists that are so fun to make (laughs) and we know you love. So rarbooklist.com. Okay, so we're going to start our show today by taking a listener question. Hi, Sarah. This is Tabitha and I am in Southern Idaho. I have two questions for you. The first is, how do you handle your private collection of books in your home? Do your children each have their own collections? How do they handle sharing between themselves? Or do you as a family have one collection of books. The second question I have is, what criteria do you use to determine whether or not a book deserves space in your private collection? There are so many good books out there, and there are some that my kids will borrow from the library over and over and over again. And I struggle with knowing at what point it's worth investing the money and dedicating the space in our home to a book. I look forward to hearing your answers And thank you so much for everything you do. Hey, Tabitha, great questions. Okay, the first question as to how my family handles personal versus family collections of books. So we have both. I would say most of the books in our home are a part of our family collection. They live on bookshelves and baskets that are out in our common areas, and they belong to the whole family. However, my kids often get books as gifts. They buy them with their own money or their book allowance. Those books that are their own belong to their own personal collections. Optimally, (laughs) these books are kept in their own room on bookshelves that are in their own room. But there have been, in fact, there was several years, years and years, my three girls shared a bedroom and they didn't have room in that little bedroom with all three of them in there (laughs) for bookshelves to live in their room. So during that time, we had several shelves in our living room that were dedicated to each. So Allison had a couple of bookshelves that were just hers and her own personal books went there. And Audrey had a couple. So that's what we've done when we don't have enough space in bedrooms. But as soon as we are able to give them the space in bedrooms for a bookshelf, we do that and they can move their personal collections there. And these are the books I imagine they'll take with them, you know, when they someday move, grow up and move out, sob. I think it's easiest to keep track of whose books are whose if their names are inside. So in general, I encourage them to inscribe their names inside their own books. Also, have you ever (laughs) had the experience of finding a book from your own childhood that you had written your name in when you were 10? It is the best. My mother-in-law has some Trixie Belden books that she wrote, (laughs) property of, you know, her own maiden name in there. Oh my goodness, it's the best. So it's fun to do that. Now, as for your second question, 
It can be tricky to know when to buy a book, right? So I tend to buy books once I notice that we're checking them out over and over again from the library, just like you said. I also buy books that are by favorite authors. So for example, I know a book with Tommy DePaola's name on the cover. I should just buy. I'm going to want to own it. Same as Kate DiCamillo or C.S. Lewis or S.D. Smith or Gary Schmidt. These are authors I love and I will just buy their books (laughs) because I know we love them. If it's an author we just love, we're probably just going to buy it. But I often use the library to give books a test run. So for the most part, if we're checking out a new book, if we're just interested in a new book or if I've just heard it recommended even, I will get it from the library. And then if we just adore it and keep wanting to check it out, then I'll buy it, especially if it's a book we want for reference later. So for example, the book Outside Your Window, A First Book of Nature, this one written by Nicola Davies. I don't know if you've seen this. It is gorgeous. And there are there are all the different seasons. It's sort of poems and illustrations about what's happening outside your window all year long. So depending on the season, there's a different poem or illustration I want to display. So that kind of a book that we just refer to a lot, that one I'm just going to buy. And I found that out because I think I checked that book out from the library like four or five times and finally went, I just need to buy this book, right? So Every so often, I comb through our family books and I start purging. Anything that really hasn't been read and loved or isn't a family staple, you know, like Tommy's books, Tommy DePaola's books are family staples. <laughs> Those are never going away. But, you know, anything that's not a family staple, anything that hasn't been read or loved recently are probably going to be collected and donated. And that way I can continuously make space for books that I want to purchase. A disclaimer is that I am constantly asking my husband for more bookshelves. So, you know, we can only purge so much, right? And, and then we just need more shelves. So no Marie Kondo here at Read Aloud Revival when it comes to books. <laughs> I hope that's helpful, Tabitha. Hey, if you have a question you would like to leave for the Read Aloud Revival podcast, go to readaloudrevival.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. You'll find a button there that says leave a message for Sarah McKenzie, and you can leave me a voicemail that I can possibly answer on a future episode of the show. Amanda Dykes is a mother of three, a former English teacher, and the author of Whose Waves These Are. And if that title sounds familiar to you, it's because I recommended it on the very last episode of the Read Aloud Revival podcast, episode 132, as a great adult book that's a wonderful choice for teens. So Whose Waves These Are is a dual timeline novel, meaning the story goes back and forth between two different stories in two different time periods, and then they begin to weave together. Books that have multiple timelines like this are my favorite kinds of books. I can't get enough of them. Okay, so it's a dual timeline. It's a Christian novel, and I think it's a really good fit for readers who enjoy the work of Susan Meisner. So if you're a Susan Meisner fan, you want to get your hands on this one too. Now, why is Amanda here today? She's here because in her research, as she was writing that book, She used picture books to help set the scene. And you're going to just love the way she talks about the power of picture books. I just know it. She's joining us today to talk about some of her favorite sea blown books. In fact, we make a book list based on the recommendations Amanda gives us, plus some of our own, of our favorite seaside adventures. And if you'd like to grab that book list, they're in the show notes for this episode. So go to readaloudrevival.com slash one three. Three. And these books are perfect for reading in the summertime, of course. We also talk about how books can be functional souvenirs and help you prepare for road trips or enjoy and remember family trips you've taken. And then we talk about how the books she read in her childhood influenced her work as an adult. So I'm thrilled she's here. I opened up my conversation with Amanda by asking her where her book, Whose Waves These Are, came from. I had been writing just regular historical fiction for a long time, meaning not dual timeline. And, you know, I had a few things published and a couple novels that are just, you know, sitting in the proverbial drawer that had had some interest from publishers, but eventually ended up being passed over. And so I just thought, well, I'm just going to try something different. I would like to write a book, like a small town book. I call it village lit, like Avonlea or Mitford or, you know, that kind of community story. And that would just be really fun, I thought. So I started to brainstorm off the coast of Maine. And this is where the books from childhood come into play because Maine has had a special place in my heart since I was a kid because of books. So I started to brainstorm, 
you know, these islands and the harbor and the, the name of the story and kind of the backstory of where the village came from. And I thought it was going to be a really lighthearted, feel good book, um, <laughs> maybe a series. And then this one character just started to sort of take over. And I've heard other authors say that before, but I never really understood that <laughs> until this guy, the character Robert Bliss, who's this sort of blustery, rough around the edges, lobster fisherman came on the scene. And I just started having all these questions, you know, why is he this way? What he seems to have a lot going on below the surface. And the story, do you want a synopsis or no? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So the gist of it, and I'll try to not give away too much, but it begins in the middle of World War II, towards the tail end of it. So what had happened was by that point in the war, you couldn't just go enlist anymore. They had closed enlistment because they needed to sort of protect a, a home front citizenship. They needed people at home too. So in order to go to war at that point, you had to be drafted. So we zoom in on this harbor town and these twin brothers, Robert and Roy. One of them really, really wants to go to war, and that's Robert. He thinks he was made for this. It's in his bones. He's kind of a warrior type character. And Roy, his twin brother, has a family. It's, they're start, starting a young family. And so he's sure if one of them is going to get drafted, it's him. Well, long story short, that is not what happens. <laughs> Everything kind of gets flipped on its head when his brother goes off to war. And his brother does not end up coming back without giving away too much. Mm -hmm. And so Robert is left just kind of trying to pick up the pieces. And, and where does he go from here? And he knows everyone around has lost somebody in the war. And so this blustery, rough around the edges, kind of clumsy lobster fisherman sits down and he writes this poem. And he hates that because he doesn't think of himself as a poet. <laughs> he thinks of himself as, you know, he's out fighting the waves and pulling in the lobster crates. And yes. he doesn't know anything about poetry. But he, he reluctantly sends it off to the local paper and under the name of Anonymous. And the gist of the poem is, send me a rock in memorial of the person that you lost and I will build a lighthouse. And he's like, this doesn't make sense, but I'm just going to do it. And then he thinks maybe he'll get a few rocks from around the town. And some days go by and he thinks, okay, it wasn't a great idea. But then some rocks begin to, to come from around the town and then from the town beyond and then from the state beyond. And pretty soon, New York Times has printed his poem and the Boston Globe and the San Francisco Chronicle and the tiny little post office in Ansel by the Sea starts to get inundated with boxes, rocks from all over the place. And so the rest of the story follows the journey of this lighthouse being built and what happens after it's built and the, fam the story of a family along the way. And I like to say it's a redemptive tale. You know, it's a story of what happens when something is broken. What do you do with that? So that's that's the gist of it. And so it didn't turn out to be that nice sort of warm, fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you said lighthearted, I thought, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it has the moments that are. Yes, but it does, for sure. And there's some great, like, you know, let's see, dialogue and interchange of some banter that's really fun in there. And so, yeah, there definitely, for sure, there's moments. And it isn't like a heavy read, but it's one that stays with you. It's not, I wouldn't call it lighthearted. I'd call it moving and beautiful. And yeah. Okay. So when you started daydreaming about this village, basically, for your story, had you said you kind of started imagining off the coast of Maine? Had you been to Maine at that point? No, okay. no, I hadn't. Except for in fifth grade, in my imagination, we had to do a state report. And I lived on the West Coast. And Maine, of course, is on the East Coast. And so I remember I had to get up very, very early in the morning to call the Chamber of Commerce before school because they would be closed by the time I got out of school. Oh, right. <laughs> because of the time time difference and ask them to send information. And I just felt like I was very, very shy, like almost painfully shy, just extremely introverted. And for me to reach out across the country felt on the phone, the phone for a shy person is a big deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I just kind of felt like, I sort of planted a part of myself over there and left it there. And it just sort of hibernated all these years. And then whenever I would read books or see movies that had Maine in it, it just felt a little bit like home. Okay. So all the kids who are listening are wondering, why didn't she just Google it? Which is funny because as you were talking <laughs> about calling the Chamber of Commerce, I remember doing a state report and having to write in for Chamber of Commerce information too. Yes. So kids, Google has not always been around. Oh, it hasn't. <laughs> It was a different time. <laughs> it was a different time. Well, I know that you and I have chatted a little bit about books sort of forming a sense of place. And 
And clearly, yeah. when you read, when I read whose waves these are, I felt like I was in Maine. So, I mean, okay, so I have a funny story for you. Just recently, I was at a homeschool conference. I was speaking at the conference. And when the conference was over, I had about a half a day to myself without anything planned. And so, because I'm crazy, I ended up buying myself a ticket to Walt Disney World because this conference was in Orlando, Florida. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> My husband was like, you're going to Walt Disney World by yourself. You are insane. It was so fun. It was so great. <laughs> well, anyway, so on the final ride that I went on, I was in line for about an hour and I got chatting with the people behind me and they were a family and I asked them where they're from and they said Maine. And it was so funny. I had just finished reading Whose Waves <laughs> These Are maybe two days before. And so my first instinct was to, to say, oh, I was just there, but I've never <laughs> been to Maine. I have never gone. I would love to go. So, I mean, that's what a good book does, right? It just makes you feel like you've been there. It is. And it, we talked a little bit before the show started about this, but that I read recently somewhere, and I think it was maybe just on someone's Instagram post or something about how place can connect people. You know, you discover whether it's in line at Disney World or on the plane or at a restaurant, you see someone wearing a sweatshirt with the name of a place that you recognize, or you pick it up in conversation, you realize you've both been there. It's like this automatic connection. And it's like you're, it's a foundation to build on. You know, you have something to talk about. You've both been to the same places and it feels a little bit like family. And I think that books do the same thing, probably even on a deeper level, mm -hmm. because there's so much to share about where you were when you read that book and how you felt. And it's really just a beautiful thing. So have you been to Maine since writing the book? We had a trip scheduled. My mom and I were going to go between the time that I wrote the book and the time that I edited the book. There was a little gap last summer. But then we found out we were expecting a baby. <laughs> so, Oh, yes. Yeah, surprise. No. <laughs> and he's really cute, by the way. <laughs> when it's totally worth having forfeited a trip to Maine in every way. <laughs> but someday, someday I will make my way there and it's going to feel like coming home. I know it. <laughs> it is going to feel like that. And I'm just so I mean, to me, this really speaks to the power of books, because that's what you had been exposed to, right? So books yes. that so tell me about that, which books helped you see Maine, I guess, in your mind's eye. Thinking back to childhood, the first one I can remember encountering Maine in was Sarah Plain and Tall, which is funny because you don't actually go to Maine in that book. But Sarah is from Maine. She comes, you know, to the, the plains or wherever they live. And it, she just brings with her this sort of fresh sea air about her and her whole personality. And I feel like she just sort of embodied Maine, you know, in what she was, just fresh life and new horizons for this family. And in the movie with Glenn Close, there's one scene that's just so vivid in my memory, which is funny because it's, you know, I don't think it's one of my favorite childhood movies or anything. The book is better, but it is a good movie. And there's one scene where there's this rainstorm pouring down and they're inside this cottage in Maine making music. Her aunts are making music on the flutes and they're dancing around and the cliffs are outside. And it just had this just ethereal kind of magic about it. And it seemed so beautiful in every way. So there was that. And then as an adult, I read Miss Rumpheus. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. It's got to be one of my all time favorites. Me too. So there was that one. And okay, so we should talk about Robert McCloskey. Yes, we should for sure. <laughs> yeah, we know him well from Make Way for Ducklings and Blueberries for Sal and What's the other one? One Morning in Maine. Time of Wonder, I feel like, is lesser known. But to me, I love all of his books. But Time of Wonder, to me, is just like something else. It is. It steals the show for me. That's and so it, interesting that you said that. I think my editor, Carolyn McCready, who edited The Read Aloud Family for me, uh -huh. I'm pretty sure we had a conversation about Robert McCloskey once. Uh -huh. And she said the same thing, that Time of Wonder was really... I'm pretty sure. I don't think I'm putting those words in her mouth. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well... High five to her because I agree. <laughs> and it's it's really the, the pictures, of course, are stunning. There's one part where it talks about the tide coming out and the kids are out exploring the beach in this part of the world that just hours ago was completely submerged. And there's just something amazing about that, really yeah. something breathtaking. And I think he does a great job of summoning that onto the page. <laughs> One of the things you said was, where can you find such high density voice, tone, whimsy, magic, just the absolute heartbeat of a place other than children's books? And yes. that sort of stopped me because I thought that is 
yes, it's a multidimensional kind of experience. And I think that's why you get that feeling of I've been there before. Yes. You know? Yeah. And I think too, with the children, with children's literature, there's something intrinsically amazing about its limited size. You know, every word has to mean something and every line has to earn its place. But not only that, it's the, the space between the lines and the cadence and the, I don't know, just the emotion of it. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about this, about why picture books are so immersive, I guess you could say, when it comes to talking about place. I was watching something about an artist, and I don't remember which artist. It may be Monet, Claude Monet, I'm not sure. But they were saying if he wanted you to see the color purple, he wouldn't just do paint the color purple. He would do like pointillism, like little dots of blue, different shades of blues, different shades of reds. And then he would leave it, he would compose them in a way that it left it up to the viewer's eye to mix those dots. And that's what they see when they stand back at a distance and look at that piece of art, they see the color purple. Huh. And I feel like in children's books, that's what happens. We have the text on the page and we have the illustrations. And then you have the reader's imagination. And I feel like those three things interact, like something magic happens. You know, it really, it's an interactive experience and it brings the story to life. Oh, that's so true. So deep into summer, I'm always looking. I love reading picture books that really capture the season for my kids that really help us sort of just experience the season more fully, at least we're in the Northern Hemisphere, we're in summer. And I know that you have some favorite sea blown books. I would love to hear your favorites. Sure. Okay. So I gather them up from around our house and in our car and everywhere we have books <laughs> tucked away. And I thought, how am I going to narrow this down? <laughs> so I did. I narrowed it down to some favorites and I put them in stacks by category. So <laughs> these are not any kind of official, like library worthy category. These are just straight out of my head categories. The first category I have is fanciful and whimsical. Oh, fun. Okay. So fanciful and whimsical books about the sea. The first one I have in my hands is Yellow Kayak. So this is a pretty new book. Like within the past year or two, I think it came out. But it has a very vintagey feel with the colors and the illustrations. And it's about this boy who takes off on this sea adventure in his little rowboat. And he's got like a giraffe friend with him. It's got a good rhythm to it very short little lines. So the next one in the fanciful whimsical category is called the Maggie B. Mm -hmm. And that have you read that one? Yes. I love it. That's a fun one. I just came across it by chance a couple of years ago at the library. And I don't know if it's in print anymore, but I think you can get just, you know, older copies on Amazon or wherever. Yeah. But the author is Irene Haas, H A A S. It's a keeper. And then I have two golden books because you can't talk about children's books without bringing up golden books. <laughs> so The Merry Shipwreck. And then the other golden book is Scuffy the Tugboat. Oh, yes. Yes. For younger kids, especially. That's a fun one. Okay. So that's the end of the fanciful whimsical category. <laughs> I love your the category. The next one is yeah. called Naturey. Ooh, okay. Naturey. <laughs> so that's very official sounding. Another golden book, Wonders of Nature. Hmm. That's a fun one for younger kids and it's got a couple of pages all about like here's a page isn't it a wonder that tiny coral animals under the sea which never move build great towers and whole islands of their tiny shells okay and then the next two are by jim lamarch lamarch yeah i'm not sure i always say lamarch but i'm not really sure yeah. <laughs> okay which is fitting because marsh sounds like pond and that's the name of the first book pond oh, yes i love this book pond and the raft mm -hmm. Both of those books are, they're not about oceans necessarily or sea, but they are about water and they're about just getting out in nature and, and seeing the world beyond your own doorstep yeah. or seeing the universe that is right there on your own doorstep in a new way yes. and, and creating place like the pond or pond, especially the kids really make a special spot at this pond over the summer. So that's a great one, especially for deep summertime. So then there's the... The timeless slash savor it category, which I have subtitled old friends in new places because oh. we know Robert McCloskey from his other books like Make Way for Ducklings. And we know Barbara, Barbara Cooney from her other books, but just to see them in Maine or at the sea is a special thing. Yes. That's the category those are from. But I also have here The Sea Chest. Hmm. I don't know that one. This book. If you have to pick one book that you don't know of from this 
podcast to order, I would choose this one. The illustrations are works of art. Yeah, I'm looking at a preview online as you're talking about it, and it looks gorgeous. And I think it might be out of print, sadly. I think it is. And that just breaks my heart because it's a really unique book and it's a work of art. Yes, there are a bunch available online as of this moment. It kind of makes me, as I'm like looking at these covers, and it makes me want to go there. You know, it makes me want yes. to. And so I know that you've mentioned before this idea of functional souvenirs. So that's something mm-hmm. I'd love to talk about because it's summer. And so I know sure. people are reading about the places that they are visiting or they like to. One of the things that comes up a lot in the Read Louder Revival premium forum is that people take a trip somewhere and they want to know, you know, books they can read that have to do with it. So, you know, they're going to go on a family trip to the Yellowstone. National Park. And so we're all giving recommendations of books that have, you know, love that. yes. And so, and I love that too, because it really kind of solidifies the whole experience. It kind of like yes. gives your child to a preview of what's like, so they kind of set some expectations and. was born, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to think this way, but when I was in college, I spent a summer in London studying. And right before I left, my brother had taken a job as a journalist for a small town paper, and he was doing a story on a soap maker, this lady who made her own soap. So she gave him some samples and he passed them along to me and I took one to London with me. And it was just a nice smell. And and then from then on, every time I smelled anything that smelled remotely like that, I was right back in London, like vividly in my flat, you know, washing my jeans in the sink, because that's what we did there, (laughs) and hanging them out to dry and all the places we got to see. And, you know, they say that smell is really closely related to memory. Well, I think books are too, and really any kind of functional souvenir, but we call it a functional souvenir because it's anything you procure from or bring along with you to a place that you get to use again in the future. So rather than like a magnet on the fridge or you know, a a pencil that gets used up right away, something that you're going to use as time unfolds, that every time you read it, you're going to be there again, or every time you use whatever it is. So like we just took a trip over spring break to San Francisco Bay Area. And before we left, I got the book Ocean Meets Sky by the Fan Brothers. Oh, I don't know this one. Okay. Oh, it's gorgeous. I think I first learned about this one. I had seen it in a bookstore, but then I think Sarah Clarkson maybe had posted a picture of it or something. Okay. And so I got it and we read it on the way. And and so now every time we read it, we can smell the sea and we can remember the wind on our faces and the hikes that we took and the boats that we got to go on and that kind of thing. So yeah, Ocean Meets Sky is a great one, by the way. I heard a lady not too long ago talk about reading a different chapter book or novel, I guess, every camping trip with their kids. So every year, yeah, they take a family camping trip and it will be, you know, she'll bring a different novel to read. And she said her kids actually call that camping trip. It'll be like, oh, well, the year we did The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or, you know, the year we did My Side of the Mountain. And of course, it makes sense, you know, that you would remember that trip. Yes. Okay. Here's a funny story. We took a day trip in the fall to go see this cave. This is called Black Chasm Cavern. Okay. And We were heading out of town. We had a newborn, so we hadn't really had time to think ahead, like, oh, what can we bring (laughs) that would fit this? So we're like, let's just download whatever we can, some kind of audiobook to listen to. (laughs) Well, we ended up downloading The Hobbit, and we're listening to it, and it's great. And it was it was the sort of radio theater version of it. Okay. And the kids were enjoying it, the older kids, and I was enjoying it, and my husband loved it. And but then it started to dawn on me: there's a lot of pretty scary parts in this that take place in caves. And we're going to a cave where there's like looming stalagmites and stalactites. <laughs> and <laughs> this could really either this could backfire on us or it could really enhance. Well we're getting close to running out of time, sadly. I feel like I could chat with you about books all day. Uh, that. <laughs> Any more books you want to share with us? Sure. Um, just quickly, The Wishes of the Fish King oh, by Douglas. Doug McKelvey, right? Yeah. Douglas McKelvey. Okay. And illustrated by Jam and Still, which his artwork is amazing. And the story is kind of just majestic. And 
the story and the artwork together are oh, majestic is the word I would use to describe it. So that's a great one. Max Lucado has one called The Boy in the Ocean. So that one has some neat sort of spiritual parallels if you're looking for something like that. Okay, speaking of old friends in new places, Margaret Wise Brown, who wrote Good Night Moon, mm -hmm. she has one called The Little Island, which won the Caldecott Medal. It's a lot like Time of Wonder in its own special way. Yeah. So that's a beautiful one. Have you seen the Lighthouse Family books by Cynthia Ryland? I think I have, but I have not read them yet. I need to get a hold of those. Yeah. So they're, I think they might be considered chapter books probably, okay. but they're illustrated and the chapters are very short. So they'll be like a like an early chapter book. But anyway, they are oh, slow. Geez. So like, as I was reading the first one to my kids, I thought this is not going to hold their attention because they uh -huh. are very slow. I think uh, my kids, I mean, my five-year-olds, my seven-year-old enchanted. And there's a whole series and they will just listen to these. One of the animals tends the lighthouse and by oh, himself. Fun. And like, it's kind of a story of an unlikely family. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Amanda. You've given us a lot of sea blown books that we can make a book list out of. I'm very excited about that. It's been such an honor and a joy. So thank you very much. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. Hello, my name is Peter and I live in Vermont. And my favorite book is Penrooks on Garden Street. I like it a lot because it's just overall really funny. And I'm eight years old. I'm Polly from Charleston, West Virginia. And I am five, and my favorite book is The Squatter and the School. And my brothers like Pat the Booty Books. My name is Corey. I am five years old. My favorite book that my mom has read me so far is The Ninja Bed Man. And the favorite book that my dad's read me so far is Star Wars, and my favorite book is The Ninja Bed Man. It's when the ninja bird man says, um, tricks the mouth. And the favorite part of Star Wars, it's when the always says, do or do not, there is no trap. I am Lee, uh, a few little pigs. Because, um, I always read it. My name is Surya, and I am nine years old. I live in California, and my favorite book series is the Wings of Fire series. I like them because they're funny, and I think it's very incredible that the dragons can laugh while being chased and saving the world. My name is Vikram, and I am four years old. I live in California. My favorite book is Frogs and Toad by Arnold Lobel. I like Toad it says I look funny in my bathing suit. Hello, my name is William Schaefer. I'm from Maple Grove, Minnesota, and I'm almost 14 years old. And my favorite book would probably be The Hiding Place. And I like that book because it just shows courage and it's a sad but moving book. Hi, my name is Millie, and I'm almost eight years old, and I live in Minnesota, and my favorite book is Walter the Lazy Mouse. And why I like it is because the main character is a animal, and I really like animals, and I just like how the story goes. Hello, my name is Aviel. I'm 10 years old. I live in Minnesota. And my favorite book to read is The Land of Stories because it's really well written, it's funny, and creative. Hi, my name is James, and I'm seven years old. And my favorite book series is The Elephant and Piggy books. My favorite one is I Will Take a Nap. And my favorite book is Piggy Snores Too Loud and Gerald the Elephant Can't Sleep. Thank you, kids. And thank you again for coming on the show, Amanda. Remember, you can get the book list at readaloudrevival.com slash 133. That's where you'll get the whole seaside or sea blown book list. And remember, you want to be getting emails from Read Aloud Revival. So if you're not getting those, go to R-A-R 
bookbooklist.com. Sign up to get our free book list and you will get a note from me every Tuesday morning with a wonderful book list or free resource that's going to help you connect with your kids and read wonderful books together. So we are so glad you're here. Grateful you're a part of our listening community. Until next time, go make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids through books. Thank you.